Hey gang, Neil here. I am back. You can see I haven't even changed since the last video. I'm in the studio. I'm hunkered down. I'm coffeeed up. I thought I might as well churn out a few of these um, before I get weary. So last video was uh, applying some theory and painting procedure to the sphere. So I just thought we'd roll on with the monochrome and the paint uh, procedure and the theory, but apply it to a slightly more complicated object, the bowling pin. Bowling pin, obviously, as you'll see, I mean, it's an egg volume, a sphere with a cylinder. So we're gonna take that same painting procedure, the same principles, and apply it to a slightly more complex object. Repetition is the mother's skill. So uh, off we go. So I have my uh, bowling pin all drawn out, ready to go. Optical boundary, meaning the outside edge and the shadow boundary, right? Those are the only two boundaries I absolutely need. Uh, let me just move this a little bit. The two boundaries that I absolutely need to get to painting, uh, I need the outside edge of the form and I need the division between light and shade, right? Can't do with anything less than that. I have my handy dandy palette as always with my 11 values mixed out, 10 being white, zero being black with nine grays in between. I have my value scale handy. I have my isolation cards to check my values. I have my brushes, my oil, my spirits, all ready to go. So, recap from the last video. <clears throat> there are, let's see, the law of transition, one of the few absolute laws in painting, but as I said before, that's if your uh, goal is to actually make form, make something look realistic on a two-dimensional surface. Absolute law of, of um, painting is the law of transition, also called the rule of three. It takes no less or a minimum of three values to create a gradation, right? You can't and creating gradations, making transitions, that's what making form or giving, making the illusion of form is all about, is controlling your gradations. That's always why in the studio classes we start with value, we start with monochrome first before we get into color, to master making uh, proper gradations and value adjustments because that is the key to making form, to making something look three-dimensional on a two-dimensional surface. So, law of transition, rule of three. It takes a minimum, certainly no less than three value changes to make a gradation, and gradations are what make form. And then we have the three approaches to describing form. Spatial, the spatial approach is, uh, um, the spatial description is expressed in planar orientations toward and away from where I am sitting as the viewer. There are five basic spatial planes, front, top, under, side, right, side, left, down on a bowling pin. Front, top, side left, side right, and obviously I can't see the underplane, and any number of variations between. If this is a true frontal plane, that's a true side plane, then what falls between them? A front side left. Front plane, side right plane, I think I said side left. What falls between them? Front side right. Top plane, front plane, what falls between them? A front top plane. Front plane, under plane. What falls between them? A front under, right? That plane is turning under. It's not completely under, like this is. So it is a front under. So spatial, the spatial description is uh, describing planes as they turn toward and away from me, right? And since we're there, we can stop and analyze. The light's in the same position it was in the last video. It's off to the left. It's high angle above, and it's in front. So consequently, spatially, the planes on this bowling pin that are getting hit the most are the front, top, side, left planes. Right, right here and here. Now, as I said, it's not the entire light mass, but it's the planes that are getting hit the most are the front top and side left. The planes that are completely in shadow, based on where the light is situated, are the under, uh, side right and under. Right? So the under and side right planes are turning completely away. 
So front top side left are turning the most towards the light, under side right are turning completely away, and the frontal planes are where you have all of your good gradations in the light mass that help turn the form. So we have the spatial description of form. Number two, that's number one. Number two, nomenclatural. The nomenclatural description of form uses terms that are called modeling factors. These are names given to planar orientations, not toward and away from where I'm sitting, but toward and away from the light. Remember, there are nine modeling factors. Highlight, which is in there somewhere, it's hard to see. Light light, middle light, dark light. Half tone, which is that soft transition between light and shadow. Dark shadow, which is always right next to the shadow boundary. Middle shadow. Light shadow, where the highest amount of reflected light is. And accent, which in this case with the sphere, with the sphere there wasn't an accent visible. The accent in this situation would be the darkest part of the cast shadow right under the object. That would be an accent. Just like highlights tend to be small, right? Highlights are caused by planes that are at a right angle to the light source and on a rounded object, those planes, it's very small. Accents are very small. Highlights and accents are very small. So what that leaves us with, the modeling factors to make form, we have three lights, three light modeling factors. Light, light, middle light, dark light. Three shadow modeling factors. Light, shadow, middle shadow, dark shadow. Light, shadow, joined by a, let me see if fingers in there. Um, half tone, right? The half tone is the link. So law of transition, rule of three, at least three value changes in the light, three modeling factors, at least three value changes in the shadow, three modeling factors, light and shadow linked by a half tone, right? So we have the spatial description of form, nomenclatural description of form, and finally the tonal description of form. The tonal description of form is when we're using number values. Is it a, a 10? Is it a 9.5? Etc. When we're using that language, we're describing something tonally when we use a number value. So we have a refresher of the uh, law of transition and the three approaches to describing form. Now let's have at it. So if you remember from the sphere, <clears throat> Step one, first thing I want to do is put in my background. And just like with the sphere, the background on this is a five. I'm not going to worry about gradating. This is more about the procedure for modeling than it is getting finicky with the background. I can always put that in later. As far as the gradation, I mean. The Paint consistency I'm looking to achieve is thin, opaque. It is thick enough to cover the surface. Right, I don't want watercolor. I don't want to see that gray in this case coming through. It's thick enough that it covers, but it's still thin enough that eventually when I couch, remember we one of the previous videos we talked about the two application methods, mosaic and couching. Couching is when you're painting wet into wet. So if I my paint consistency is thin, opaque, it's thick enough to cover, but it should still be thin enough that when I couch into it, I can make adjustments easily. I don't want that toothpaste consistency of the paint right out of the tube. I want to add a little bit of my medium to it. In this case, I'm just using straight linseed oil drawing off the side of the pile so I don't grab too much. The medium thins it, makes it creamy so I can move it around, and yet it's still thick enough and opaque enough that it retains the value that I'm using. It's always what I try to tell my students in the studio. If you're thinning it, really thinning it, I understand you know people who start painting, their hesitation to put a an opaque layer on there, but if you've taken the time to pre-mix, to prepare a palette, and you're not even keeping the opacity of the paint you're using, then you're really undermining the work you've done preparing a palette. 
I mean, if I, in this case, need a five value for the background, if I grab the five that I've taken time to mix before I started painting, and I'm not getting it on here opaquely, then I've just really uh, wasted my time pre-mixing the paint if I'm not even getting the full benefit of the value that I took time to mix. So I want the paint a little thinner than the toothpaste that's right on the palette, but I want it thick enough that it will actually cover uh, opaquely, right, and get a true sense of the value. So background, step one. Step two, the middle shadow. And what does that mean? The middle shadow is the shadow mass, the average shadow value that I see when I squint until my eyes are almost closed and look up at that bowling pin. I, clearly when my eyes are open, I can see. The entire shadow mass is lighter down here and darker up there. Why is that? Why is there the gradation from lighter to darker? Because obviously the bottom is getting more reflected light from the tabletop. The top is getting less reflected light. So I don't want to shoot for the darkest value that I'm seeing, darkest set of values. I don't want to shoot for the lightest. When I squint, I'm going to come up with an average, right? It's going to be a value right around in the middle that isn't the darkest and isn't the lightest areas. And of course, we also talk about how in any given area of the shadow, the dark shadow is always right next to the shadow boundary. The shadow boundary is the line that divides light and shadow. The darkest shadow at any given point is always right next to that boundary because that's the area receiving the least amount of reflected light. The form of the bowling pin as it turns away from that zone, it's called the zone of tangency or the core shadow, as it turns away from there, it's getting more reflected light. So when I put the middle shadow in, it means I'm squinting until my eyes are almost closed and I'm coming up with an acceptable average value that describes the entire shadow mass. Remember, I'm going to, later we're going to couch in all of the gradations into the shadow. I'm looking to start simply with one unified mass. And from the last project, right, the sphere I'd mentioned, I'm using a seven value object. I know in my studio what the average shadow value is for a seven value local. So I painted it over and over and over again. In my studio at least, it's a three. So I know I can grab for a three and get the average shadow. on. If I were in another studio or if I had, if it was daytime and the windows, uh, my shades were open, of course then the value would change, right? The shadow value would probably end up getting more reflected light so I would have to revisit uh, the value that I'm using, but in a good controlled lighting situation, at least controlled lighting environment in my studio. And as I said, if you, you know, you guys out there that are watching this, pick up a Fisher Price bowling pin and paint it up with gray, depending on what your environment is and your setup is, you could be coming up with a slightly different um, value uh, in your shadow, and that's okay. I'm just telling you what I'm picking based on the environment here and in my studio setting. So, middle shadow is the entire shadow mass stated with one value. background, middle shadow, from middle shadow to the light light. And in this case, it's not one light light, it's two. There's a light light, a large grouping of light planes on the ball of the head, uh, and a large grouping of light planes on the body. When I squint, it makes it easy to see. And that's exactly why, if you remember, the reason we follow this sequence is we're trying to remove, get off the plate, the things that are easiest to spot. And spot and simplify. No problem spotting the shadow mass, right? And no problem simplifying it when you squint because the values are already close together because it's receiving less illumination. Go right up to the light light. I'd mentioned the last video. 
uh, 23, 24 years, however long I've been teaching, a long time, I've never had anyone, regardless of their lack of experience, um, who had a problem when they squinted, never had anyone who couldn't see where those light lights are, where those largest, lightest areas are when they squint. Never a problem. So, from middle shadow up to light light. Find the value that I need. Again, in this case, in my studio, it's around an eight. And put it in. As I tell my students, I always, I'm always feel, I always feel free to be a little generous with the size of the light light. I don't want to be too generous. Remember, when I did the spatial um, analysis, based on where the light is situated, it's the front top side left planes that are getting the most amount of light. So I don't want to just keep dragging this over. It might, it might, it might be generous and open the light light a little bit more than where I think it should be, but I don't want to drag it over way into modeling factors where it shouldn't be. If it's the front top side left orientation, then I can't just continue to drag it down. Why? Because this all becomes an underplane, a front underplane here. I can't continue to drag it over here because it becomes a front side right plane. So although I um, can be a little generous, I still have to be careful that I don't start, start invading other areas too much. I got my light light in here and the light light on the head. So, background, shadow, light lights in this case, then to the dark light. The dark light, the reason we go from light light to dark light, again, the idea that I'm trying to get the areas down quickly that are easy to spot or locate or simplify. The dark light modeling factor is always right next to the shadow. So although I don't know the tonal value or the width of the dark light, I know if I have a shadow boundary down, I know the dark light is right next to it. From my experience with a seven value local, I know the dark light is somewhere around a five plus five and a half It in. Now the dark light, really all these modeling factors, they get thinner or thicker depending on the rate of curvature of the object. So if we just look at this object in its totality, oh, that's probably being a little too generous with that dark light, we have a fast rate of curvature, right, with the small head even faster rate of curvature, faster meaning it curves quickly. So in the areas where the rate of curvature is fast, the bands of gradation are smaller, right? Where we have an object, or in this case, part of the object where the rate of curvature is slow and the planes of gradation are wider, then of course the modeling factors are gonna be wider. So as the dark light goes down, I know I can feel free to widen this up a little bit. So, that dark light goes all the way down. So, background, middle shadow, light light, dark light, and to complete my three, right, my law of transition, rule of three in the light mass, whatever area isn't light light or dark light, the process of elimination, whatever area is left is my middle light. Middle light, I remind you, right? It's the area in the light mass that isn't turning directly into the light and isn't beginning to really turn away. It's in the middle light orientation that I am usually best able to get a sense 
of what the actual local value of this object is. Now, of course, as I said, I know going into this what the local is because I painted it, a 7. So I'm going to put a 7 in here. Under normal circumstances, when I set up in front of anything, uh, you know, human, person, complexion, I mean, um, doing a portrait, a piece of fabric, whatever, I don't necessarily know immediately what the local is. So I have to find the, at least try to figure out where the middle light is, middle light area, so I can get a good sense of what the local is. In the case of full color, obviously it's what the hue value in chroma is. In this case, it's just a matter of figuring out what the value of the local is. And what I forgot to say with the last video is what this process of mosaic is called, mosaicing, this is referred to as a hard lay-in. I'm getting my initial application of paint put down and it's hard meaning I am leaving these bands, right, like a paint by number, intact, ideally so that after I put them down without spending any time blending, I can stand back, squint, and I should get the same value feeling here that I have in front of me, right? I shouldn't say feeling. I should get the same impression of value change here, even though it's posterized and a little choppy because of the mosaic. I haven't blended it yet. I should get the same value read here that I do in front of me. If I don't, then I'll make a modification to one or more of the modeling factors before I take all that time to blend. So this is called a hard lay-in, where I'm putting these modeling factors in, in mosaic fashion, where I'm putting them in simply in large bands without blending to begin with. Get my middle light in up here. Once I get the mosaic done, my degree of satisfaction if everything looks good. That dark light might be a little dark, but there's a lot of blending, so I'm going to go with it. So once I get the light light, middle light, dark light in, I have the light mass in mosaic fashion. Now I can blend. You remember the two blending directions are two P's. Parallel and perpendicular. Parallel follows the edge of the paint, perpendicular at a right angle. So instead of between light, light, and middle light, I need to create broad transitions, broad gradations. I don't want to be doing the parallel because the parallel creates small bands of gradation. I need large bands of gradation or transition to make this form turn. So I'm using the perpendicular. At this point, all I'm trying to do is get the paint mixed together, get those values that I put in, start the initial blending process. And the reason I say initial is more often than not, I will have to go in and add some value breaks or transition values to smooth out the gradations, especially when we're dealing with an object that has wider bands of gradation. Because of the amount of area I have to cover with the blend, it's likely that blending alone, it certainly starts the process of transition making, but it's likely that the blending alone isn't going to give me the soft transitions that I need. So I'm going to have to, at some point, actually put in transition tonal values to smooth out the gradation and complete the modeling. Switch to a smaller brush. Have to be very careful blending between the middle light and dark light that I don't completely wipe out the dark light, which is very common. I've seen it in my classes. People get a little too aggressive with the, the perpendicular blending and they end up completely obliterating 
the dark light. It happens. If it does, no big deal. You just have to go back in and restate it. But with a little controlled blending, you should be able to at least leave some of it intact, even if it needs to be touched up at a later time. Soften the edges. And I'd mentioned this is where the parallel blending is great for softening edges because it can help retain the drawing. If I went around with a perpendicular blend on the edge, I would completely destroy the line drawing. Just clean up the edge just a little bit. So, I have now blended the modeling factors in the light. Light, light, middle light, dark light blended. Now I want to hit the halftone, right? The halftone is the soft transition between the light mass and the shadow mass. And here again, like the outside edge, this is a boundary. It's a boundary that I don't want to just destroy with perpendicular blending. So my first option, my first course of action in blending for the halftone is a parallel blend. If the parallel blend doesn't do it, then I can start to play with a little bit of perpendicular and parallel. It's going to take some time to do this and get used to it. This is all about brush control and paint control. It's also why getting a consistency of paint that isn't too thin, where it just picks up, or too thick, where it's impossible to move, is very important. Okay. So, half tone is at least underway. As I said, I know I'm going to probably have to do some cleanup work, but that's okay. I got the three lights in the light mass, the half tone. Now I want to get the three lights in the shadow, or three, three modeling factors in the shadow, sorry. The three shadows. I started with the middle, which is the average. Now I want to go in and drop in my other two values to create the three that I need to make form by getting dark shadows and light shadows. Dark shadow is always right next to the shadow boundary. In this case, it also gets even darker up here. I still see a gradation in there, but the dark shadow is not only every area in here, it's a little bit darker right along the shadow boundary where the dark shadow exists, but the entire ball up here, the shadow on the ball, actually even gets darker than what's down here. I started with a three. Drop down to a two and a half for the head, in this case because I know that's what I'm going to have to do to get the overall darker value up here going. And work it down into the shadow. And in this case then, I'm not doing a mosaic, right? I mosaiced the lights, I put them in separately and blended them in the shadow. I am couching, right? wet into wet, dropping in lighter and darker values, wet into wet into that average shadow mass. Go back and hit the half tone. I mentioned last time that <clears throat> usually if I have to, depending on how much I have to drop the dark shadow, I might stop and just hit that half tone before I move on. Dark shadow, the middle shadow is already there. Now the last order of business is to get in my light shadow, right? The light shadow is the lightest shadow that I'm seeing, the lightest set of shadows. They happen to be down here because the bottom of the bowling pin is picking up reflected light 
from the tabletop. There's actually a little bit of shadow. Oh, there's an underplane. I might as well get that in. Helps it turn under a little bit. And just a hair of lighter shadow, not as light as this, just a bit along the edge to make the ball pop. So, I now have three modeling factors in the light. Light, light, middle light, dark light. Half tone that unifies light and shadow. And three modeling factors in the shadow. Dark shadow, middle shadow, light shadow. The last two modeling factors, highlights and accents. Now again, on a rounded form like this, there are no accents, but I can go in and drop in slightly lighter highlights in this area and that area. Pop them up in value just a little bit more. And then I'm going to go back and do some modeling refinements and transition refinements in here. So I like to at least make my way through the entire form first, get all the component modeling factors necessary to get the minimum amount of value changes required to make form. Three lights, three shadows, one half tone, right? That's the least amount of value changes I can get away with if I want to make form. At least get that moving. And then I have the rest of the painting session or multiple sessions to go back and refine, refine, refine the rest of it. So I'm going to hit a couple transitions in here, see if I can smooth it out. And that should do it. And I say that should do it. That should do it for at least this demo, um, certainly depending on how much time I wanted to spend on the smoothing this, smoothing the form, um, you know, it could take me a while to get these forms blended and smoothed to the degree that um, I was satisfied. I'll just get this a little bit smoother for the demo. So in this case, as I mentioned, oh, oh, probably a little too dark. Because between the middle light, ah, middle light and dark light, I didn't get the degree of transition that I wanted. Right? The blend didn't give me a smooth enough transition. Now I'm going back in with a tonal value that is between the middle light and dark light to smooth out my modeling. So as I said, blending is always the first option. That's why we use oil paint. Blending is a snap. But if you're not getting the transitions that you want, the form isn't as smooth as you'd like, or if the planes are not turning properly after the blend, then you need to take some time and get a transition value or transition values couched in to assist with the blending. mentioned with the sphere video, I'm not zigzagging. When I'm doing this, I'm actually picking up and putting down with these strokes. So it's not a matter of just going back and forth like I'm coloring. I'm actually picking up and putting down these little value adjustments 
like strokes. Right? It's called Dauben. Actually, no, correct that. These are what's called the even handed stroke. These little paint marks. It's like hatching. One of these lectures will go over the types of paint marks. When we went over the application methods, we'll go over the types of paint marks. Basically ways of putting your your brush, the actual mark down, mark making. The half tone needs a little assistance. Just a little thin, especially down here where the form gets wider. Right, that rate of curvature opens up. That's looking rounder. I haven't really touched the head because that was a little easy because it's so small. It was easy to get some of those transitions in just by blending, but the bowling pin, the body of it, because it's a slower rate of curvature is going to take a little more work to smooth out. Delicate touch. Uh, a little more dark light on the head. Get that turning. Get my big noggin out of the way of the paint demo. The reason I always like to do the bowling pin, anyone can do a sphere, right? You've probably seen people do spheres. The bowling pin is more like organic forms, right? All natural forms taper and flare, right? Flare, taper, flare again. So the bowling pin is very much like natural forms. When you think about it, it just looks like a person, right? So Certainly mastering the sphere is important, and that's step one. But moving on to more complicated volumes, very helpful to get you ready for natural forms. Just a few more touches, and that will do it. So all these little adjustments I'm making to get the transitions better, right? I'm couching these adjustments in, wet into wet, to get these adjustments in. Just a little shadow boundary over here. I'm working the optical boundary out. It's very common as you're working, you're going to lose your edges. You just have to, don't freak out. Just get them back, make adjustments. Always where my students get a little uptight if they lose a boundary. If you got it once, you can get it again. No need to get uptight. Have some confidence in your ability. I know oil paint, again, we love the blending, but the fact that the paint can move around and doesn't stay in one place, it requires a lot of patience and control. If you lose track of it, just get it back. Take your time and get it back. Softening edges a little bit. Softening the edge. Doing a parallel blend. Mixes the edge into the background, which gives me what is called an edge plane. The edge plane is the last plane on the object before it turns away from the line of sight. The edge plane is either darker in value or weaker in chroma than the plane that's right next to it. That helps it turn away in space. Just one little adjustment here and then I am calling it.
that's it. So, application of the painting procedure, modeling factors, rule of three to the bowling pin. One more, one more, because now I'm here, now I'm into it. I'll just hit that highlight a little bit harder so it's easier to see. I have to build up a little impasta. Of course, that might not be visible from where you are. Probably not. But I'm going to do it anyway. There we go. And that's it. So application of the painting procedure that we worked or we used on the sphere to a more complex um, double curved, which means it's curving both top to bottom and side to side. Uh, application of the painting procedure to a more complex double curved surface object. So one more recap. Repetition is the mother of skill. Background, middle shadow, light light, dark light, half, oh, oh whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, let me start again. Background, middle shadow, light light, dark light, middle light, blend. Blend your lights, right? After you blend, half tone. You achieve the half tone either by blending or depending on the size, you might have to actually state it. But blend for the half tone. So now I have my lights in, three lights, light, light, middle light, dark light, half tone. Now get into the shadows. The middle shadow is down. I'm going to couch in, dark shadow, light shadow. So I have my three modeling factors in the shadow, then highlights, accents, then go back in and do whatever degree of smoothing, finishing, polishing, forming, and finishing as necessary. That's it. Any questions, you know, as always, leave them in the comments section. Like and subscribe. Share away. I hope you've enjoyed the video. Be back soon for more. Ciao.